The last six months or so has seen a vicious war of attrition unfold in towns like Ugledar, Solidar and Bakhmut. But this should not be interpreted as a stalemate, as those struggles seem to have degraded the quantity of functional Russian equipment and depleted their fighting manpower. Will the much vaunted spring offensive and defeat of its forces in 2023 finally bring an end to Russia's genocidal and pointless war against Ukraine? And how fragile would Russia's autocratic propaganda controlled system actually be after a major humiliation on the battlefield? Welcome to Silicon Curtain Podcast. All our content is also available on popular podcast platforms like Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Please subscribe to help new people find our fantastic speakers. And of course, if you enjoy the content, do please consider supporting us by becoming a patron. Today, I'm speaking with Anders Puck Nielsen, influential YouTuber and military analyst based in Denmark. He specializes in naval warfare and strategy, but in today's video, we're going to be talking much more about the campaign in Ukraine and that much talked about spring offensive. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome you for a second time to the channel. Well, thank you. Thanks for the invitation. <laughs> oh, we had a hugely stimulating discussion last time, and it got a lot of comments. You have an incredibly, uh, I think, loyal audience that you've built up on YouTube <laughs> with your insights. I mean, lots of, of people cover day-to-day -day activities. Very few look at the war in such a sort of strategic manner as you do. So, uh, you know, how, how have the last sort of six months been uh, for you? Uh, well, very interesting. I mean, um, it's, as you say, that's definitely how I try to do it to sort of uh, take the broader perspective, see, okay, what are the bigger trends? Partly that's because I think that's where I have more to add to the discussion. Um, there are other channels on YouTube that do very well, those daily updates. Um, but also it's it's just I don't have time for the daily updates. So so it makes sense for me to sort of pull it together. And then I make videos about stuff that where I feel that, okay, the discussion is kind of going here. And then um, so, but but uh, it's, uh, as you also experienced, like uh, just huge interest on YouTube for uh, these kinds of discussions that we are having now and that the, the channels are growing. So there's a whole community now of, of I think, very good YouTube channels. Um, covering Ukraine. It's, it's one of my primary sources of information, really. And uh, I, I don't know what it's like in Denmark, but certainly the coverage of Ukraine in the mainstream media, it's dropped off sharply. Um, and it's only when you have these big sort of theatrical uh, moments, which we'll come to in a minute, like the assassination of Tatarsky, uh, the attempted assassination of Prilepin, then you'll you'll get a little bit of coverage. But uh, or, of course, the drone strike on, on Moscow. But there is still this kind of bias that things that happened in Russia will perhaps be covered or more likely to be covered. Things that happen in Ukraine, including horrific drone strikes, are now almost seen as a sort of daily event and they don't get that kind of attention. And also the the depth that the media goes into is 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 not that great typically on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so that I think there's a real need uh, for you know deeper discussions, and I'm sure you you see that uh, in the comments. And I know from people's comments that the U.S. media is is even more disengaged, perhaps, than the European media is uh, with the conflict. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I will say from my experience, uh, the Danish media are actually quite keen on bringing Ukraine uh, content uh, like they want to tell these stories, but they often have a hard time sort of figuring out the angle because there has to be a good. It has to be a good news story as well. So. Uh, so, so it does become these things where now something happened in Bakhmut or, you know, very, these very local things where, where they have good images to put on the screen as well. Um, and it, it becomes very fragmented. And one of the things that I have sort of noticed where I think we as, uh, YouTubers perhaps can, can contribute, it's this thing that, that often the journalists they they don't have the time to follow this on a daily basis so they lose the big picture of, of, of what's going on and it it does become this very uh fragmented image that they're trying to portray or like just what, what did the institute for the study of war write this morning um so uh, whereas 
you know, if you follow this every day over months, then you can sort of see patterns that that the mainstream media can't. And one of those patterns, I and mean, we're going to talk about Victory Day in a minute because that that's an extraordinary moment. But one of these patterns that we see emerging is the assassination of uh, Vladimir Tatarsky, uh, the attempt assassination of these sort of. Yes, he he was an author, but he's also uh, you know a key uh, player in the military. Zakhar Prilepin, uh, Daria Dugina, whether that was intentional, whether it was her father was targeted. We see a whole series of fairly theatrical, highly staged, highly orchestrated uh, assassinations. And there's a there's a pattern emerging here, isn't there? Which is that they are all extreme uh, nationalists and, and propagandists. Um, and it's quite difficult, isn't it, uh, to to actually come to a conclusion about what's really going on and, and who is behind these. Exactly. I mean, there, there's so many people that might want to <laughs> might want to get to these people. So it's it's really uh, it's it's really hard to to come up with uh, one very good explanation for who must who must be behind that. Because the way I see it, it I mean, it could be everything from from the Ukrainians over sort of groups inside russia fractions uh there and uh or the the russian state i mean yeah i i think there are good explanations for all of them so it's it's really hard to to see but but what we can say definitely is that that this pattern is emerging that we are seeing these things happening inside of russia now so the the war is gradually moving into the Russian society in a, in a way that it didn't do before. I mean, just recently the, there was a drone strike also on the Kremlin. And I mean, no matter who was behind it, it definitely shows that now the war is also happening in the center of Moscow. So, so um, that's definitely a pattern that's happening and that we can have all these discussions about who exactly did it. <laughs> but uh, um but, but it is interesting that it's happening. And and I personally found it really interesting that like um, 15 months into a war that Russia believed would take only a few weeks, like suddenly Moscow is under attack by somebody. Uh, you know, it, it says something about how the war is going, doesn't it? It certainly does, and uh, you know the 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 uh, the sixty song "Burn Baby Burn" comes to mind. There's all these images as well of factories, security installations, research centres, a lot of stuff connected with the military um, burning down on a, on a near sort of weekly basis, um, and that's given rise to again a lot of debate. As has the drone attack in Moscow. Is this an internal insurgency? As uh, Panamarev uh, claims. There is a, an active uh, sort of terroristic Russian opposition. I think almost no one believes that there is a centralized, organized opposition that fits that description. It it may be a useful cover story. Uh, maybe he's helping Ukraine, you know, cover its tracks with special forces on the ground. Maybe it's the FSB. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's there's just so much uh, speculation around all these things. However. The targeting of military facilities must require quite a high degree of organization, unlike, say, the burning of the recruitment offices, uh, the Weinkermatt, uh, as they're called. You know, they burn on a regular basis, and it's quite likely that actually a lot of those are just individuals who, who hate the idea of, of those being based in their neighborhoods um, and generally object to the war. So you, you you do have a kind of, I'd say, sort of chaotic insurgency, um, which uh, almost certainly is not going to really coalesce into an organized opposition. And then you have this highly structured, highly targeted uh, destruction of uh, sort of military associated facilities. Um, what what do you think the probability of that being Ukraine actually is? Well, I, I think there is a spectrum. I think there are some of these things where you can say that's that's almost certainly not Ukraine, like the the, the recruitment offices, for example, the the local recruitment offices around Russia, probably not a target of Ukrainian sort of special forces. And then there are things happening closer to Ukraine, hitting the things that are very obviously connected to Russian military logistics, like the the, the uh, train derailments in, in the Bransk region, or uh, of course the drone attacks also on, on um, oil refineries that are happening. I think these these things, are the, I mean, the drone attacks obviously 
uh, Ukrainian. Um, and I think there's a very high likelihood that the train sabotage is also the work of maybe Ukrainian special forces. So, so I think there is a spectrum where some of it is definitely Ukraine. And I, I would definitely assume that Ukraine is doing these kinds of clandestine operations also inside of Russia. And then there are things that are definitely not Ukraine. And then, then there's all the things in the middle, right? We don't know exactly who did it. Uh, so we have these military facilities, uh, factories, uh, things like that, where it's kind of high profile attacks. And you'd say, okay, this probably requires some kind of inside knowledge and to, to, to do this. Um, it's, it's not something that just some angry teenager goes out and does. So, um, there is the spectrum and, uh, but, but I will, I will agree with you that, that, that probably the, 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 the whole notion that there would be some kind of militant, uh, opposition inside of Russia it's it's not super likely that this would be some very organized, very capable organization that, that can orchestrate all these things. That um, I mean, I mean, it's really hard in the current climate inside of Russia to do such a thing. It would be super dangerous, and the, the likelihood of this being exposed would be very big. So, um, so it's I I I think the the likelihood of that is. Small, but I mean, we can't rule it out, of course. And of course, one thing we're concerned of is that the core of the Siloviki, the FSB, the GRU, they may be active uh, in supporting the war, but they're not going to be sent to the front lines. So that kind of security infrastructure uh, is there, it's in place, it's as powerful as it's ever been. Um, and so, as you say, you know, if you if you are trying to orchestrate uh, some kind of uh, whether it be protest uh, or uh, you know insurgent type act, I mean, the likelihood, as you'll be found out, is is still extremely high. You know, the state has not gone away. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but at the same time, I mean, it it can be really hard from the outside to see what's going on and who is actually covering for whom, like. Um, if, if we look at some of these, I mean, it's a different example, but some of these military blockers, for example, who, who in the system is actually protecting Igor Girkin, for example? Why why has he not been arrested? Like, definitely somebody in the system is sort of covering for him. Um, and I think probably the same thing for Prigozhin by now, right? Like, that might change because... I mean, he's really taken it <laughs> to an, another uh, mile this week um, with, with some of his statements. But I mean, so th there definitely are dynamics going on inside the system where different fractions are fighting with each other. And, and you have these sort of related actors that are somehow have sponsors within the system that cover for them. And so... so I mean, I, I don't think it would be a, a big insurgency would be uncovered. Uh, but I mean, definitely things are happening within the system as well. And I think Western media, I mean, that's a very broad label there, but I've been watching quite a few interviews um, with journalists and they, they ask, you know, I guess the obvious questions when you see that outburst that Prigozhin made, that sort of expletive laden tirade against Gerasimov and Shaigu. He even said some disparaging stuff about Putin, I believe, in that. Um, my take on that is that he would not do that unless he felt confident that it was still within the limits of the sort of orchestrated system. Uh, he would not go beyond the boundaries of what's acceptable. Now, those boundaries may have changed as the regime becomes more desperate, but... Western media will, will ask, the, ask the question, you know, is this a sign of civil war? Is this a sign of fragmentation of the regime, et cetera, et cetera? And I think we're projecting onto these uh, activities what we expect to see from, from, you know, the perspective of our own systems. It absolutely does not mean at all that civil war is going to break out. It does not mean at all that the regime is going to kind of fall apart and descend into sort of internecine conflict. Yes, there is a a tussle between ministries there's a tussle for resources as they become scarcer that's natural but i still think they're playing a game where they understand the rules um and where they wouldn't necessarily go outside of the prescribed boundaries even though those boundaries might shift and change a little 
In general, yeah, but I will also say that um, Prigozhin apparently is on the ground uh, around Bakhmut, and he might actually have a sense of what's going on in the front lines that 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 other people don't. I mean, he ha he might have a real perspective on how bad the situation is, and it might, to some degree, be be real desperation that we are seeing. Like if if he. Um, you know, after these videos, we've actually seen the Ukrainian forces take back quite a bit of terrain outside of Bakhmut, and 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 Prigozhin might be looking into uh, an effort that is basically collapsing and, and could cost him more or less the entire Wagner force. So, so there might there might also in this not only be theater, but also some kind of real anger and desperation. Um, we can't rule out that, and and in that case. I mean, I could see how he could perhaps take a sort of punch at, at at even Putin, without it being some kind of very carefully planned thing, but just more an emotional reaction. And but maybe then, it's uh, yeah, maybe it's getting yeah. a message through. You know, he he's obviously not isolating for two weeks to see Putin, so he's not getting that direct face time with Putin, which apparently some like Patrushev is. And maybe this kind of rant is the only way to actually get a message through the barriers and intermediaries, which he knows Putin will actually see. And rather than perhaps being completely upset about it, he'll get the message and understand like this is this is the situation on the ground and it's being shielded by all of these layers of, you know, sycophants and, and bureaucracy and so on. It's it's difficult to understand. Now, something that we also could endlessly dissect is the Victory Day parade yesterday. And this idea that there's sort of a lack of equipment, a lack of manpower, very much, I think, can be read into the Victory Day Parade. Um, many parades were cancelled, not, I believe, because of security fears, but because they almost certainly don't have enough equipment and manpower to do parades across every urban centre. So they wanted to really concentrate on Moscow. Even then, there are significantly fewer troops on the ground in that parade yesterday. And then it comes to tanks, and I'd love to know your impression here, because <laughs> already the sight of a single T-34 at the head of the parade has spawned an entire galaxy of memes. But I also think there's there's a shift that's taken place here. Despite those Victory Day parades seeming kind of absurd in previous years, they have had a kind of solemnity to it, and Russia, by both experts, neighbours, etc., was feared as a military power. As we watch yesterday, do you think Russia has become a parody of itself? And do you think the fear factor is now dropping away that they once had? And that parade can see, be seen in its full kind of absurdity. Well, absolutely. Uh, it was a much smaller parade and it was not impressive. And um, when you hold that together with the, the general... Uh, lack of progress on the battlefield in, in Ukraine, Russia's inability to actually produce the military results and the kinds of losses they're taking where, uh, you know, they are basically consuming their entire force of, uh, of, of old tanks and stocks, the, the, their ability to mobilize. Um, I mean, that, Russia is basically undermining their own ability right now to 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 be that military power in the in the coming years. Um, so yes, to a certain extent, it is becoming a parody of itself, and also, uh, you, know, you know, Putin has become sound. You know, he sounds like a broken record, right? It's the same thing over and over, and it's like, what, 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 don't you have anything new to add? Like, what, what is your solution to this? There's there's, there's really nothing there, right? And I think um, if if we take this to see how, how how can this influence the Russian society, I mean, definitely this is also something Russians will see. And there, uh, currently, there is no real alternative inside Russia. Like, who else would you support but Putin? Because um, it's 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 not evident that there is anyone to uh, rally around. But I mean, the moment some kind of new figure shows up with new um, new solutions, then then definitely all this may backfire at Putin because it has become a parody, uh, uh, right? And um, but but on the on the flip side, I will also say I think it's it's also important that we don't underestimate Russia as a military power going forward. I mean, 
one thing definitely this war has shown is the uh, the willingness to use violence, um, the 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 under the, the the sense that military power is an acceptable way to solve disputes in international politics and um just the uh the the, the brutality that that the, 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 the that the Russian military is capable of I mean that's definitely dangerous and Russia will still be a big country and they will I mean, I, I doubt they will use every tank that they have in stock. So they will have they will also have the ability to do things after the war in Ukraine. So I think I think that's uh, as a, just as a military analyst, that's one of the, 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 the things that I'm, I'm sort of trying to 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 fight against that tendency to now perhaps underestimate the Russian military and say, look, they how they screwed up in Ukraine. Yes, they did that. But a lot of it was maybe also because of bad political assumptions and and those kinds of things going into the war and we should be careful not to underestimate them going forward also because of course take the example of stalin i mean in the 30s he uh, killed the majority of the uh, the officer class uh, liquidated them in the great terror but when it came and and of course he made some terrible mistakes in the early days of the second world war um but after that, he did cede quite a lot of control to the generals um, and a new generation of, of of leaders and commanders sort of came up. And of course, we saw uh, the Soviet Union retake, uh, well, half of Europe, um, which compared to not being able to take Bakhmut is, is, is quite a stark comparison. But it does mean that, you know, under different leadership, um, you know, a new generation of, of, of Russian military strategists and tacticians could emerge. I mean, they they may still change. It seems unlikely they'll move away from the vertical power structure and the sort of Soviet techniques. But it's not impossible for them to to learn some of the lessons uh, of Ukraine. Well, absolutely. I mean, there is a, uh, some likelihood that the Putin's successor eventually will be somebody that very much shares the same kind of worldview, but it might be a person with that is more capable uh, that, that just uh is is more competent at actually uh turning this into reality right so uh um, so, so it's definitely you know just because russia is performing poorly right now we should not that that should not lead us to to complacency and one of the tendencies that we see is the uh, further ritualization of violence within russian culture so Victory Day, absolutely. But we also see, and it's been written about by uh, historians, including Ian Garner in his book, uh, Generation Z, we see the emergence of extreme militarization within kindergartens, primary schools, and the school system itself. Um, a glorification of the idea that it's sort of noble to, to die um, rather than live. And there's some very disturbing sort of... Uh, tendencies going on there within society and also violence itself as you mentioned earlier from you know the fires the drone attacks assassinations there is also a tendency for that violence which is is imbued the culture to actually become actual as well in society do you think that is going to are we going to see an increase in that as uh, ukraine approaches victory uh, you know, more and more sort of violence um, some controlled and some chaotic within Russia itself. Uh, absolutely. I think the Russian society is, for several reasons, becoming a more violent uh, society. One of them will just be that many of the veterans coming home will have more violent tendencies. Like uh, they, they have had the experiences in Ukraine about how to deal with violence and, and and they will bring that home to their villages. So, so just in that very sort of uh, primitive sense, uh, the Russian society be, is becoming more violent, but we are also seeing, I think, I think the long game for the Putin regime is also now to sort of try to change the sort of societal contract from something that was very much about uh, stability and economic progress and you stay out of politics and then, uh, then, then we will do the ruling of the country to a, a, a more fascist kind of society where uh, people are more politically engaged and um, uh, emotionally attached to the politics of the government, but where it's also a much more violent kind of system where 
you know, uh, the, the, the state and the people and the leaders sort of um, grow together and, and everything that falls out of that is just to be annihilated. So we see the kind of uh, um, um, a gradual twist towards this image that 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 Russia is under attack by the West and that they need to be they, now is the time to stand together and to fight for Russia and be emotionally attached to this uh, this project and that every every kind of opposition must be met with violence. So definitely on on on, on all, in all senses I, I see the Russian society becoming more violent uh, right now. And of course, you know, we actually see places like Belarus as being a laboratory for tyranny. So the sort of repressive techniques that are now uh, unfolding in, in Russia and have been intensifying over the last year, we saw them actually put into practice a couple of years ago in, in, in Belarus. We also saw behaviors in Ukraine, in the occupied Donbass, to a lesser extent Crimea, but but also there as well. Um, deportations, filtration, uh, sort of torture of opponents. Um, we see the reputed kill list uh, where they were going to go in and all those body bags um, in that invasion of Kiev. I think we mistakenly thought, you know, the incinerators and the body bags were meant for their own troops, when actual fact, they had a plan, or it's been written about that there was a plan to arrest and liquidate the uh, Ukrainian intelligentsia to anyone who was likely to resist, anyone in civil administration. Um, and they had a list of people who they thought they could turn into assets and agents. They had a list of people who they prefer to leave the country. And I believe they had a list of people who they didn't believe they could turn under any circumstances and they would just sort of get rid of them. Um, those sort of, let, let's label them what they are. So Stalin, Stalinist, you know, sort of Nazi uh, type uh, cleansing, to use Putin's term of society. Uh, they've been contemplating this stuff for a while. And we can see, or at least I can see that Russia itself is being turned into a gulag and those same repressive techniques against, uh, you know, any kind of academics, intellectuals or cultural figures who who don't buck down on the regime. It's quite you know, reasonable to think that, that the Russia will uh, will start to enact these policies on, on home territory. I think they will. Um, I don't think in the beginning of the war, I think the plan was that this would be sort of a, a, a phase and then much of that repression would sort of end after that i don't i'm not sure it was the the, the point from the beginning to turn russia into uh a, a big gulag but definitely the way the war is going i uh, it, it really seems like the only viable option for putin by now to 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 continue down this path and um i mean at least i i don't see how how else he would uh react right now like uh He's he's basically painted himself into a corner, right? So, uh, so so that is the way it's going. Yeah, and he's 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 desperate, and I think uh, we've seen over the years he's pretty much capable of anything. You know, especially if you ascribe to the belief that the apartment bombings in the early two thousands uh, were were actually you know an operation which uh, which he would have devised or led. Um, you know, if you accept that as true, then then everything else that follows. Uh, makes makes a lot more sense. And I think this is where also um, maybe analysts and the media fall into another trap. We see all this happening in Russia and we immediately think, oh, well, there's bound to be a fracturing of the elite. There's bound to be fragmentation of the country. The empire is going to fall. There's going to be a revolution, etc. But listening to um, a very astute Russian uh, analyst, uh, journalist, uh, Michael Naki, he said something absolutely terrifying, and that is that Russia could lose this war decisively. They could be ejected from every square inch of Ukrainian territory and then simply spin another propaganda narrative. Tell the people that actually this is a victory. Ukraine's denazified. And then they start on something else. It could be Georgia. It could be you know, another country that's not sort of uh, buckling down um to 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 russian influence control and they descend into this sort of north korea scenario almost immediately so there's no 1905 revolution there's no 1917 all the contrarians 
mm-hmm. all the so-called liberals who may have uh, opposed this have either left the country or they're in prison or they've been cowed into silence. So, you know, wishful thinking. We may see, uh, you know, we may see uh, not 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 a Russia sort of collapse and change uh, based on what our, our wishful thinking would like to see, but we may see a, a rapid descent into this uh, closed North Korean scenario and no descent at all, which is which is a worrying prospect. Hey, absolutely, it's possible. Um, and and I think there is a, a something that Vlad Vexler talks about uh, a lot. This that the possibility that um, you know this uh, depoliticized blob in the middle of of, of Russian politics, like the, uh, the 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 majority of the Russian population, will just be happy to use any excuse to stay demobilized to double down on being politically disengaged. And I think. Definitely, that is possible. You know that, that that Putin can sell basically any kind of story as a victory, and then people will just be happy that this is great. It means I don't have to do anything. Then now, well, let's let's just say this was a victory. Let's call it that. It's fine for me. Um, so, um, so you know this whole thing about how, how bringing the war onto Russian soil and into the life of ordinary russians is a process that's um that's really interesting to observe right now because one way or the or another it is happening and if the war continues it will continue to happen as well um also uh just just because of mobilization these kinds of things um but um also it's possible that ukraine could sort of use that in the war i mean it's definitely many different discussions about to what extent ukraine is behind all the sabotage that we talked about right but i can see how just bringing all these things onto russian soil into the life of all these russians that want to stay depoliticized um it's uh it's 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 perhaps a way of making it harder for putin to go that way going forward yeah, I think so. And that that that's a good sort of case of why Ukraine may be uh, behind it. Also, they are very sort of clean, very strategic. When we see these buildings burn, they are the exact buildings. And it's obvious to everybody, you know, what their purpose was and why they've been targeted. As you say, we see the drone strikes on sort of fuel and logistics lines. And again, this seems to be a hallmark of Ukrainian methods, which is extreme accuracy, extreme focus. And you know, bending over backwards not to have any collateral damage to civilian infrastructure or civilians themselves. Uh, almost certainly, they're doing that in deference to you know the U.S. and allies who who have asked them to be incredibly cautious and careful. Um, but I also think it's because Ukraine uh, want to maintain the moral high ground and not be seen as an aggressor that's equivalent to Russia. But that could backfire as well because. Yes, these strikes, Russians will know about them, but they're not feeling them. You know, it's not their apartment blocks that are being destroyed. It's not their supermarkets. It's not their transport and uh, electricity infrastructure that's been taken out. So to an extent, they're still shielded from the full impact of the violence when you compare it, of course, to the experience of every single Ukrainian. Yeah, but if you if you see it from, from Ukraine, would you want to, what you would want to do is to of course, hit the Russian sort of military industrial complex. So that's fires on the factories and these kinds of things. And then it's the more symbolic uh, attacks on um, Putin himself and his power base. So that would be humiliating him, undermining the image that Putin is trying to build, that he's the strong man that has things under control. Uh, so you, so you want to you wanna undermine that, um, but you don't want to actually make people very angry at you right so so um i i don't think we will see those kinds of attacks where there will be massive civilian casualties in russia because that could backfire the other way and actually you know help putin's narrative that that further mobilization is necessary what what you want to do is you want to create the the impression that further mobilization is pointless because 
this war is not under control anyways. And that's, a, I guess, a worrying thing. If Putin becomes too desperate, then a mass civilian casualty event as a false flag is certainly within his his toolbox. Absolutely. As you, you mentioned the apartment bombings, I don't think he has any hesitation at all to blow up a hospital or uh, apartments or a shopping mall, whatever. No problem at all. I do not think he would blow up something like the Kremlin, uh, these symbols of uh, Russian greatness. Um, so, but, 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 uh, you, you know, he, he could definitely take that step in trying to uh, mobilize the Russian population against the Ukrainians on a more personal level. Mm. Well, let's talk about the spring offensive because that forms the focus of so much YouTube material. So I'm wondering whether we can we can sort of examine it in a more sort of strategic sense. Do you think at the moment we are seeing the start of not the full offensive, but shaping and probing operations ahead of the potential offensive? Uh, we're definitely seeing shaping operations. I no doubt about it. Uh, Ukrainians are both along the front lines, pushing the Russians, seeing what's the reaction, um, where are the weaknesses, uh, and also the strikes on logistics, uh, um, oil refineries, uh, uh, all these things. It's definitely happening on a scale that is much larger than a couple of months ago. So, so that we're definitely seeing. Um, and then it's really hard to see, say exactly where I'm not sure there will be one day and then suddenly the spring offensive is there. It might be sort of a gradual increase in intensity. Um, I definitely think the recent sort of, uh, gains that Ukraine has made around Bakhmut, for example, are interesting. I mean, it's not massive, but still it's enough. Like we're, we're not just talking a few about just insignificant numbers of meters changing hands here it's it's something that that could turn into a, a real momentum so so i i mean exactly where are we on 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 on, uh, on this um uh, line from just shaping operations and until the real uh spring offensive i think we can say maybe that when we see the western equipment when that is documented in 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 action we see the the challenger tanks and and the Leopards and and the Bradley vehicles. When we see that on the front line, then then that's definitely we we can call it the the offensive. That's the signal, yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, it must be a real challenge as we've seen. And and Ukraine has done an extraordinary job at keeping secrets from Russian agents, Russian assets, uh, but also you know releasing them in error. And of course, as we saw with the U.S. document leak, actually keeping its intentions secret from allies. Do you think they're going to be able to maintain this extraordinary control over information and their intent? Um, I, I don't see why not. Uh, I think w regarding the offensive, I think the the approach has been sort of the opposite of trying to keep things secret, but rather to just sort of um, overflow the information space with all kinds of mixed signals. So nobody knows which one is the right one. You know, well, one day it's uh, already begun, and the next day it's oh, preparations are still ongoing. One day it's going to be, um, it's going to be huge when it happens. The next day, ah, oh, don't don't get your expectations too high. It's going to be in the north. It's going to be in the south. We, we get all these kinds of different messages, and I think it's just a way of trying to conceal what your plan actually is, because you know you can't actually keep things a secret. So you might as well just try to be confusing. Like throwing out chaff, isn't it, to uh, to distract? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and another interesting narrative that's come out is this one that's really been, you know, picked up in the, in the Western media, and that is that there is one shot to victory. You know, the spring offensive is a make or break moment, all or nothing, et cetera, et cetera. And the way that a story sort of forcefully emerged over the last couple of days maybe leads me to think that that also might be another one of these sort of decoy messages for the media that actually the offensive is going to be as you say more of a slow burn on multiple fronts but perhaps they want to give russians the impression that it's going to be one huge event in one particular part of the front it, it absolutely might be yeah um and to some extent i think if we look at 
the the reaction from Prigozhin, for example, really trying to draw attention to the Bakhmut sector of the front line. I mean, those are the kinds of things that might be helping Ukraine, right? Because it might pull more resources to exactly Bakhmut, which is probably not sort of the main axis of the the offensive anyways. So, so I think it, it is working. Um, and we are starting to see this kind of panic where on the Russian side, where there's sort of drawing um, attention to, to, to all kinds of different places. Um, but I will say though, I think in the West, it's important that we don't, uh, we don't expect to like this very rapid kind of very decisive action um, that, that we also have a realistic expectation that it's it's probably more going to be the long push, and it's also not super likely that this summer will end the war. So it's it's uh, it's it's still going to be necessary that we also help Ukraine in 2024 and 2025. Uh, we, we might as well think like that because um, it's it's. I mean, that would really be some. Uh, extreme degree of success if Ukraine were able to 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 make to decide the whole war just this summer. It, it is, and and of course, Ukraine has shown itself to be quite cautious in using men and equipment. It's had to fight very hard to get that Western equipment, ammunition. I'm sure they've stockpiled a considerable amount uh, to be ready for the offensive. Um, but another reason why you know they may not have a sort of one push one shot offensive is the potentially they do not have all of the equipment in place and all of the trained manpower uh, yet uh, in place to actually run uh, you know a huge mobile offensive a sort of blitzkrieg um so again we may see this caution uh, based on the fact that equipment is still coming in um and there is now talk of fighter jets and etc but of course, those are not yet um, I was gonna say on the ground. That's the wrong illusion there in the air. They're not there available yet to, mm. to have an impact. And of course, Britain is talking now about uh, missiles with long range capability. But again, it could take many weeks, maybe even a couple of months for this equipment to arrive. Absolutely. But I also think if we just look at you know, most people talk about the possibility of an uh, uh, of, uh, offensive in the south, like the Zaporizhia region. And if you look at that area, it's actually quite well suited for the kind of attritional warfare that worked pretty well for Ukraine in the Kherson region, right? That, that you can actually cut off the supplies to that area, very long supply routes, and um, mostly going through areas that are within range of Ukrainian uh, rocket artillery like high mars or airstrikes and so uh, it, you know it might not be meaningful to make a very quick attack on that area it seems more more meaningful to sort of try over months to tear to wear down the russian forces and um and let the attrition work uh so um i i would not be surprised if we're going to see ukraine trying to sort of um, uh, do the same thing they did in in Kherson. It was a lot easier in, in in Kherson because it was just a couple of bridges that they had to take out. Now they have to take out. Um, it's it's a more much more complex system of supply roads, but they are also they also have the capabilities, right? They have they have the equipment to do this, and we are seeing it with the kind of uh, drone strikes that they're doing right now. So, so I would definitely expect this offensive to not be something that's over in the spring <laughs> it's it's going to go well into the summer and, and and the autumn as well and this attritional struggle i mean it, many russians will actually be seeing the videos of some of the videos from the front the awareness that this is not going well that it's a a brutal sort of meat grinder must be getting through certainly to people who are younger and of that sort of mobilization age and I think there's a certain lack of enthusiasm, isn't there, on the Russian side to be mobilized, to be thrown into that meat grinder. Um, so this this sort of plays to Ukraine's advantage because there is still high morale on the Ukrainian side. Um, there may be also manpower shortages there. We don't really know. Um, but people are fighting for their own land. People are fighting for survival, for their culture, for their language. Um on the Russian side, I think the enthusiasm as this war grinds on will actually get less and less. Yeah, I um, I, I agree. 
And and actually, I think if if Ukraine can push Russia into another wave of mobilization in the middle of the summer, then that is that would also be a good result for Ukraine, right? Because that will really be something that 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 can shake the Russian society. Um, if they get the stories about the meat grinder thing, we see uh, more and more stories about people not coming home from the special military operation, and we see more and more signs inside the Russian society that uh, that the the system is uh, not in control of the situation. Like, and then suddenly there there is another wave of mobilization because the attrition in Zaporizhia is enormous. Then. Then, then that is something that could, um, you know, make make things uh, very, very difficult for the the Russian regime. And I've just got two more questions here, and they're more big picture sort of strategic ones. And the first of the two is the challenges of victory. Let's assume that Ukraine is victorious, whether that is taking the Donbass or taking Crimea and Donbass, um, and whether that's this year, next year, or uh, you know, God forbid, twenty twenty five. But let's assume Ukrainian victory uh, happens. Um, there are the challenges of rebuilding. There are challenges of creating a resilient society, which I, I, you know, that will be difficult. But I actually think Ukraine will overcome that. Do you think, in the future, Ukraine is set to become a, a technological engineering superpower, um, but also a military uh, superpower in terms of its capability? Uh, and as a center of military production. And we're already seeing a leopard production facility being set up in Ukraine. This could be the the sign of of potentially a, a vast new future industry. Uh, absolutely. Uh, you know, uh, within Europe, Ukraine is already a, a military superpower. Um, I mean, the, the Ukrainian army uh, is the strongest army in, in Europe um, at, at the moment. I, yeah, I used to be, I used to say it was the second strongest because Russia was the strongest, but now Ukraine, the Ukrainian army might be the strongest. Um, so uh, definitely Ukraine is, is going that direction. And I, um, I will also say, I think, you know, Ukraine is getting closer to NATO and, um, in you know one way or another might be full nato membership uh after the war um so so uh and and i think it's definitely uh, a country that we in western europe should want to get into nato uh we want the ukrainians to be on our side uh if something happens so um so so yes i i do see ukraine going that way and also of course ukraine has an understanding of what it's like to be against the Russians that many people in Western Europe don't have. I think that's interesting, isn't it? Because you speak to anyone from the Baltics and they've been trying to sort of say this stuff for years, trying to tell us what a threat Russia represents and explain to us what it's like to be under occupation uh, of Russia, which they you know were for decades. The same with Poland and other countries. They have a very direct understanding of that. And this idea, as you said, of, of Ukraine already being a, a tech superpower. I mean, it was at the forefront of technology, engineering and uh, space industry in the Soviet Union. You could almost describe Ukraine as the sort of brains uh, of the outfit um, in the USSR. Um, and what we could be seeing here is a significant future pivot from the sort of Franco-German axis as the sort of pivot point or center of Europe we could see a decisive move uh, where Ukraine is no longer a borderland, but is actually a central territory in terms of uh, you know, economic power, military power, decision-making power, especially when you combine that with the huge military capability and investment of Poland, also Finland, incredibly well-armed, well-trained country to the north there. Um, and I think Britain's starting to tap into that, isn't it, with the idea of a sort of northern alliance between, uh, you know, Scandinavian countries, uh, the Baltics, Britain, and um, and uh, and sort of Ukraine, Poland, as a kind of additional layer to that uh, NATO guarantee. Uh, absolutely, we are seeing the countries of Eastern Europe sort of taking the lead uh, now. Um, 
of course, Ukraine, but also the other countries you mentioned, Poland, uh, Finland, uh, the Baltic countries. So, and then that we have the countries of Western Europe try, trying to sort of keep up here, right? Um, so once this war ends eventually, um, then Europe will have to find a new kind of security structure uh, and find out how, how do we organize this going forward? Because I think Russia will still be there as an adversary and um, Belarus will probably be on the Russian side and then we'll have to figure out how, how do we organize for that. And I think um, it's uh, the, the threat is not going to go away and the, 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 the potential instability from, from, from that side is, is, is huge. So um, and Ukraine will play a big, big part in that. Well, what I, I do also think it's interesting you talk about Ukraine being a technological superpower in these ways. Um, I think we are seeing a lot of that actually taking place in the current shaping operations, right? With the drone strikes that Ukraine is conducting, very long range drone strikes. Uh, a lot of this is Ukrainian production. Um, it also seems that Ukraine is at least testing out some of their Grom missiles, uh, right? That basically, you know, okay, if you're not going to give us attack missiles that can actually hit as far as we'd like, then we, we we can build our own, right? So so we are seeing Ukraine actually leveraging their expertise in uh, in, in this area. It's, it's extraordinary, isn't it? I think um, this is another area where Russia has been very capable of deflecting and hiding um, you know, history or, or, or uh, you know, um, dominating the history of the Soviet Union. But when you look at the space race, uh, when you look at uh, military industrial complex, advanced, uh, you know, avionics, electronics, um, and of course, you know, aviation equipment, well, a lot of that stuff and, and missiles as well was actually Ukrainian engineers. I mean, famously, Karolyov, the godfather, genius behind the Russian space program, um, was of Ukrainian extraction. So, you know, there's been this process of masking uh, Ukraine as mm. as such a capable country. And of course, Russian propaganda have labeled Ukrainians as, you know, rural dimwits or slightly sort of humorous peasants for, for generations, whereas in actual fact, uh, you know, an extremely advanced European civilization in terms of economy, engineering, literature, uh, philosophy, and any field you care to mention, I think we'll start to see Ukraine becoming a real force uh, in, uh, in in European life. And it's 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 interesting also just to uh, after 2014 how big problems um, the Russian Navy got, for example, with their shipbuilding because all the gas turbines were were, were built in Ukraine and now they couldn't get them anymore. So it, it, the Russian Navy was in, uh, incapable of building frigates for a while, uh, and they still really haven't figured out how to build reliable gas turbines. So it it just shows that Ukraine is really. Uh, really good in, in in some of these technologies, mm. and and it also points to why, amongst you know, uh, not just the sort of colonial genocidal intent, which is clearly there, but also you know, one impulse uh, behind Putin's invasion is to take back those brains and capabilities uh, within the Russian sphere. Well, Anders, it's been a huge pleasure speaking to you again. I think we've covered an amazing array of topics there and I think brought ourselves up to speed with with uh, what's happening in the conflict. And um, who knows? I mean, in three or six months' time, we may have uh, plenty to talk about again because things are moving rapidly. But for today, uh, I think, uh, you know, on behalf of the audience, I want to give you a huge thank you for uh, spending time to talk. Well, thanks. thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure.